This is the uh, third and final part of this talk before I move to conclusions. Uh, so in this work, uh, I will talk about how we can systematically identify words that require context to translate and how we can evaluate context aware machine translation models on them. So this is an ongoing work, but you can find a version of this paper on archive already. Uh, so we discussed how context is crucial to translate certain discourse phenomena during document level machine translation. Uh, but while generating like proper translations of these ambiguous phenomena is very important, they only represent a small portion of the words in natural language data. And this is why common metrics such as blur uh, do not provide a clear picture of whether models are ap appropriately capturing context or not. So recent works tries to perform targeted evaluation using contrastive data sets, but uh, the, there, um, these uh, data sets only cover a limited set of discourse phenomena for a few language pairs. And the difficulty of broadening these studies stems from the reliance of um, these works on introspection and domain knowledge to identify the relevant discourse phenomena, and also uh, the requirement to engineer language specific methods to create test suites or manually design data for evaluation. Also, these evaluation methods uh, tell us how accurately models can choose one translation over another, but this does not actually matter translation performance directly. So in this work, we try to fill this gap by proposing a data-driven and a semi-automatic methodology for identifying the salient phenomena that require context for translation. And we apply this method to create a multilingual benchmark that tests these discourse phenomena. So after um, making this benchmark, we then evaluated the different context aware machine translation models on our benchmark, as well as those that are commercially available. So in the previous work, we introduced CXMI that can measure context usage. And this is done by the context C uh, and measuring how much information the context C provides about the target Y given the source X. But, and CXMI can tell us how much context is helping the model to process a corpus overall. But in this work, we wanted to ask ourselves if we can quantify on a more fine grained level under which circumstances we require context. And we are interested instead in measuring how much the context is helpful for single sentences or particular words in a sentence. So we proposed a sentence level extension of CXMI called point-wise cross-mutual information. And intuitively, PCXMI measures how much more or less likely a target sentence is when it is given the context. And we further expand this to the word level, which we can use to identify what kinds of words uh, tend to see their likelihood increase when the model is given context. So to identify student translation phenomena that require context, we perform the thematic analysis by examining words with high PCXMI across different language pairs, and we manually identified patterns and categorized them into phenomena where context is useful for translation. So to describe our methodology, uh, in the first step, we systematically examined the mean PCXMI per POS tags, uh, per part of speech tags. And then we looked at the vocabulary items with the highest PCXMI to detect phenomena that are reflected by certain lexical items that can consistently benefit from context for translation. And three, we looked at the individual tokens with the highest PCXMI in the context of the sentence that they appear in, which allows us to identify patterns that do not depend on lexical features, but rather on synthetic constructions, for example. And we performed our analysis on data from TED Talk transcripts that have been translated, as they have parallel document level data in several languages. And we looked at 14 different language pairs. And we chose this uh, group of target languages for the high availability of TED Talks and for linguistic tools that we will later use, as well as for the diversity of language types that is represented in our comparative study. So we have languages from different families and with different uh, grammatical structures. We have like SOV and SVO languages. So in this table, we report the corpus level CXMI on the TED Talks data set uh, for the 14 language pairs as well as the mean P6MI for the words in the data set. And firstly, we find that there is relatively high average P6MI for proper nouns uh, for several languages. And if we look at this more closely, uh, we can see that um, in this first example, context is helpful when proper nouns and named entities may have multiple possible translations, but the same entity should be referred to by the same word in a translated document for lexical cohesion. 
So in this table, we have examples of wards that have high PCXMI, which is highlighted in pink, and then the related source and target wards that are highlighted in blue and green. And in here, um, so uh, Avelio can be translated into Chinese um, as AWEVR, uh, but then there are several other plausible ways to translate uh, an entity into Chinese, like Awei R is also another plausible translation for this name. So we therefore need context to know which translation has been adopted in the document to translate this consistently. Uh, and next in our analysis, we find Hai means P6MI for uh, second person pronouns, pronoun two in languages, uh, and these languages we see, they encode politeness distinction, uh, such as German, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, and Chinese. Uh, so while English uses the same second person pronouns for everyone, these languages perform TV distinction where this pronoun depends on the level of formality and the relationship between the speaker and the addressee. So in this example, in French, we say votre for your if you want to show respect to the person we're speaking to, such as an older stranger or our teacher or our boss. But for more casual conversations, such as with a friend or family member, ta would be used here instead. So we need the contextual information on the relationship between the two speakers to translate accurately. And for languages like Japanese and Korean, where we use honorifics and speech levels for politeness distinction, we also find high PCXMI on verbs and particles. So in these languages, prefixes and suffixes of certain words and the verb lemma can depend on the relationship between the speakers and on the formality of the conversation. So in this example, the verb hosoku uh, shita and the particle da uh, indicates a casual politeness level in Japanese. But in the more formal conversation, we would say instead hosoku shimashita and idochu desu instead of da. Uh, now in the second, uh, the third part of our analysis, we find that several languages have high PCXMI on pronouns. And these are typically languages that use gendered pronouns that are not used in English. Or another example we have here is uh, for dual pronouns in Arabic, where they make the distinction distinction between singular, dual, and plural. Whereas in English, we only distinguish between singular and plural entities. Uh, so to give an example, shovels and picks are grammatically feminine in Portuguese. So the pronoun to refer to them should be the plural feminine noun elas instead of elis. But in English, we do not have grammatical gender assignments. And we also do not use gender third person plural pronouns either. So we need the context to understand what they refers to and which gender to use. Uh, now we also find high PCXMI for certain verb forms, such as the future form in Italian or the imperfect form in Spanish, French, Italian, and Romanian. And this is because while English verbs may have five forms, uh, other languages often have a more fine-grained system of verb forms and a more complex verb morphology. So for example, English has only one single uh, form for the past tense, whereas languages such as Spanish and French have multiple verb forms for the past tense. And in this example, the verbs tenia in Spanish for had or asian for made are in the imperfect form because the context of these sentences um, shows that these verbs are employed to describe actions with no definite beginning or end. But uh, these sentences can plausibly also uh, have uh, actions that describe a single event rather than a habit or description. So in this case, the petelite form could also be used instead. And so verbs must be translated using the verb that reflects the tone, mood, and the cohesion of the document, which is also highly dependent on the context. And finally, well, when we analyze the individual tokens that have the highest PCXMI, we find that many of these examples are due to ellipses in the English sentence that does not occur on the target side. So for example, in this uh, sentence, the English text does not repeat the verb no in the second sentence because it can be understood from the previous sentence. However, in certain languages such as Turkish, there is no natural way to translate this verb phrase ellipsis, and so we must infer that don't um, and I don't refers to I don't know, and we need to translate the verb and have the verb no appear in the second sentence for Turkish. 
So after identifying a set of linguistic phenomena where context is useful to resolve ambiguity during translation, we develop a series of methods to automatically tag tokens belonging to these classes of ambiguous translations. And we propose the multilingual discourse aware or MUDA benchmark for context aware MT models. Now to automatically tag words that require lexical cohesion, we first extracted word alignments from a parallel corpus. Then for each target word Y that is aligned to our source word X, if the alignment pair X and Y occurred at least three times in the current document, we tag Y for lexical cohesion. Now for language that, languages that use distinct pronouns for different levels of formality and that have TV distinction, we tag the target pronouns where formality distinction occurs. So the second person singular pronouns in French, for example. And some languages such as Spanish and Italian often drop the subject pronoun and TV distinction is instead reflected in the verb conjugation. So for these languages, we automatically detect verbs with a second person subject in the English source, but are then conjugated in the second or the third person in the target text. And for languages such as Japanese and Korean, uh, which we mentioned have a more complex honorific system that is beyond just pronouns, we constructed a word list of common honorifics related words to tag. And now to find pronouns in English that can have multiple translations in the target language, we manually constructed a list of pronouns for each language where a single English pronoun has multiple translations. So for example, in French, it can be translated into il or elle. Uh, so these are ambiguous. And then we tag all the target pronouns that belong to this list if they are aligned to an English pronoun in the same list. Uh, and then for verb forms for each target language, we constructed a list of verb forms. If um, a single verb form in English can be translated into multiple target verb forms, and we tag all the verbs uh, whose morphology belongs to this list. And finally, to detect translation ambiguity that is due to ellipsis, we look for instances where the ellipsis occurs on the source side but does not occur in the target side, which means that ellipsis must be resolved during translation. So to detect when ellipsis occurs in the source but not in the target, we first trans, uh, trained an English ellipsis detection model by extracting an ellipsis data set from the English data in the pen tree back. And then for each sentence pair where the source sentence is predicted to contain an ellipsis, we tag the target word Y, if Y is either a verb, a noun, a proper noun, or pronoun, and if Y has occurred in the context of the document, and if Y is not aligned to any word in the source sentence. So in this figure, we can see the number of Muda tags on the TED testing dataset for different language pairs. And we see that the frequency of different tags can significantly vary across languages. And overall, we find that ellipses are infrequent. Uh, and this is partly explained because for only 4.5% of the English sentences have been marked for ellipses by our classification model, which gives an upper bound for the number of ellipses tags. And we do remark that languages from a different family than English have a relatively higher number of ellipses tags. Uh, and we also see that Korean and Japanese have more formality tags than other languages that have TV distinction, which is aligned with our intuition that register is more often important when translating into languages with honorific existence. Now, we wanted to verify the correctness of our automatic tagger. So to do so, we asked native speakers of nine languages we studied to manually verify the Muda tags on 50 randomly selected utterances, as well as all the words that have been tagged for ellipses in our corpus. Uh, and by the way, we are still looking for Arabic, Dutch, and Romanian speakers who can help us verify a second version of Muda that we're currently working on. So please do reach out to me if you speak any of these languages and would like to help. Um, yeah, and so across all the languages that we evaluated, we achieved high precision on all the tags except for ellipses. So ellipses is particularly complicated to tag automatically because we see that false positives often come from when a single source word is translated into two or more words, but our automatic tagger, uh, our automatic aligner, sorry, does not align all the target words to the corresponding source word, which is why the, our current methodology for detecting ellipsis resolution tags these words as medium ellipsis re resolution. 
And another common mistake is when the reference is not a word by word translation of the source sentence. So many of the target words are not aligned to any source words, even if there is no ellipsis. Uh, so we believe that our ellipsis tagger is still used when selecting difficult examples that require context for translation. And despite the low precision of our tagger, we still find significantly high PCXMI for ellipsis words for many target languages. Uh, so to evaluate our models, uh, we evaluate a sentence level machine translation model as well as a context server machine translation model on our Muda benchmark. And for these models, we trained a small transformer model. And for the, con con the context aware model, we use the concatenation method that we previously uh, talked about. Uh, so in this table, we show the results of our uh, baseline models that are trained either without context or with context. Uh, and then for the latter, either with the predicted context that are fed back into the decoder or the reference context during decoding. And first we find that although blue scores are highest for uh, models that are given gold context for most language pairs, Comet is most often higher for models that are not given context at all. Uh, and next, in terms of the mean word F measure of overall words, we do not find significant differences between the three systems. So it is therefore difficult to see which system performs the best using only corpus level metrics. And now for words that do require context for translation that are tagged with Muda, our context aware models obtain only a marginally higher word F measure than context agnostic models, which suggests that context aware models are not sensitive enough to context or they are unable to use the relevant information to context to translate ambiguous words well. To evaluate potentially stronger models, we additionally trained uh, a large model that was pre-trained on a large corpus for German, French, Japanese, and Chinese. And for the pre-trained large models, we do see that context-aware models obtain slightly higher scores on these um, corpus level metrics, blue and comet. And we find more pronounced improvements for uh, certain tags and Muda, such as ellipsis, lexical cohesion, and formality. And finally, to assess if commercially available machine translation engines are also able to leverage context and perform well on the Muda benchmark, uh, we consider two engines for evaluation. So the first is Google Translate, where our experiments show that this model only does sentence level translation, but we still included this in our evaluation due to its widespread usage and recognition. And then the second model that we looked at is the DeepL translator which is an engine that advertises its usage of context as part of their translations. And our experiments also confirms that they use context to a certain degree. And our other experiments with other providers such as Amazon and Azure indicated that these are not context aware either, which is why we do not include them in our study. So among commercial engines, DeepL seems to outperform Google on most metrics and language pairs. And the sentence level ablation of DPL, which is um, we use the DPL model, but only fed a sentence by sentence, uh, we see that it performs worse th um, than its document level system for most of the Muda tags, which further suggests that DPL is able to handle context to some extent. But overall, uh, current context aware machine translation systems are unable to obtain considerable improvements over their context agnostic counterparts on our challenging Muda benchmark. So we wanted to release the Muda benchmark to encourage the development of models that can address these ambiguities. Uh, so this is the, um, the end of the third part of my talk. Uh, so before I move on to the summary and the implications, uh, I would like to pause for any questions on this.